Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. We, we have the opportunity this morning to begin our service with the celebration of life change as someone has come into the family of faith and will be responding through obedience to the Lord in baptism this morning. But the invitation is open to all of us to come to the water of life, who is Jesus Christ. So before we get to witness this, uh, this celebration through baptism, would you stand with me, please? And may we sing together. Be seated. Well, good morning. Is my, my on? Okay, good. 
Come on in, Taylor. Today we get to we celebrate baptism, the changed life. Taylor Phillips comes this morning um, to to illustrate and to be obedient to what went on inside of her just a few weeks ago where she accepted Christ and so she died to herself and that's represented in going into the water and then as she comes up, it represents the new birth and the new life we're given in Jesus Christ. And so Taylor, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I have. All right. Would you like to follow him in believer's baptism? Yes. All right. There you go. So Taylor, on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and being obedient for him and to following him in believer's baptism. I baptize you as my Christian sister in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask Dan Flanagan. I'm going to ask Dan Flanagan to come. Is he here? Come on, Dan, and introduce and welcome. great to see you and great for the opportunity to welcome you to Kemsville Baptist Church. Uh, so many of you that may be visiting with us today, we certainly extend a very cordial welcome to you. Hope that uh, you can find fellowship, God's love here, and that you will return again. There will be a little flyer on your bulletin that we ask that you fill that out and put that in the offering plate as it is passed. And uh, so our staff can know you and get to know you just a little bit better. I would also like to just say, welcome to everybody that's here every Sunday. You know, our staff usually comes up and does this, <clears throat> but it's good to uh, know that you're welcome too. And uh, your faithfulness is what makes this church really go and really grow. And we're thankful for that. The other opportunity that I have this morning is to introduce our guest speaker for the day. I happen to know just a little bit about him, some of which I better not tell, because he's going to be <clears throat> he's going to be up here after I am, and uh, uh, he probably knows some of which he better not tell too. Uh, <clears throat> but Matt Flanagan uh, has been uh, <clears throat> involved in ministry for. Uh, the, the most of his life uh, from a uh, member of the youth group here at uh, Kemsville Baptist Church as he grew up. Uh, while he in Center College was a youth minister, uh, while doing uh, graduate uh, work in chemical engineering at the University of Kentucky, was involved in another church uh, <clears throat> in youth ministry, and then uh, much to his mom's chagrin, moved he and his wife and kids to be to southern Georgia. And uh, so every day on our prayer list by Jenny, my wife, was, Lord, find Matt a place to minister in Kentucky so he can get my grandkids home. But anyway, <clears throat> that happened. And Matt has been at Parkway Baptist Church for a number of years, uh, has uh, completed his a master's in theology from uh, Campbellsville University. And uh, this will sound like a dad, <clears throat> but it's reflecting what many others have said, including our own Ed Pavey. Uh, Matt is one of the premier youth ministers in the state of Kentucky and throughout the Southern Baptist Convention and has many, many opportunities to, to go and to speak. And, and I'm, as a daddy, I'm very, very proud of him. One of the things that sort of stands out for me and, and one of the most important things in my life has uh, been when Matt and his brother Will accepted the Lord in this church. Then Pastor Dr. James Jones asked me if I would like to do the baptism. And I stumbled over a yes pretty quickly and uh, had the opportunity to baptize my two sons. And that's a uh, has been and will continue to be a very highlight and a very special moment in my life. In a moment, as we move on through the service, uh, Matt's gonna come in to share the word. 
I don't know if he wants me to introduce his family or if he wants to, but I'm going to. Uh, my favorite daughter-in-law from Bardstown, Felicia, Matt's wife, is here. And my two grandsons, Caleb and Eli, are here as well. Yesterday, I don't know how much time I have here, David, but I'm going to go ahead. <clears throat> they, you all know this about David. He has everything down to the second. What an organized person he is. Whew. But anyway, yesterday, Matt, Caleb, and Eli all ran uh, a race at Danville at Center's Homecoming, where, where Matt had gone to school. And uh, Caleb, who is uh, captain of our team in Bardstown, uh, <clears throat> came in second in that race uh, with a great time. And then Eli ran, and then Matt came in too. Uh, <laughs> but he made the race. And, and uh, I guess this started a year ago when uh, uh, he, he started running this race. And uh, he said he was doing all right to a lady with a buggy stroller and her little kid passed him. So after, <clears throat> after that, he's been working hard and, and working out and really working to do this. But a, a family thing like this is really great. We, uh, in our family, value what it means to be a part of a family and what it means to be a part of the family of God. And I hope that as Matt comes that you will prayerfully listen to the words that he shares with us. Now, it's time for us to uh, stand and greet each other. Greet somebody that you haven't greeted before. Give somebody a hug or a handshake and then the kids can come forward. Well, good morning. Good morning. You guys can do just a little bit better than that. I believe it. So we're going to try it one more time. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Now, you see, now you guys got to equal that. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Well, I am so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. I have a little, uh, a little demonstration for us today, right? and just kind of a couple of questions I want to ask you guys. How many of you guys know what this is? What is it, Pace? You don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Angelina, what is this? Something you would play a cat with a cat with. You're right, okay? It is, you guys can't see it, sorry. It's a laser pointer, right? Now, if there were a cat up here, what would the cat be doing right now? It'd be chasing it all over the place, right? I can give testament because I have a cat. I do have a cat, and it loves the laser pointer, okay? So there are things like a laser pointer that a cat would chase after, right? If we're in the middle of class at school and someone has a bouncy ball and they bounce the ball up high, are you going to be listening to your teacher? No. No, you're going to want to like follow the bouncy ball, right? Right? Okay. So there are a lot of times in life, a lot of times we get distracted. Can you guys say distracted? Okay. I'm going to read us a little story here from the Bible about someone who got distracted and they weren't focusing on who they should have been focusing on. Okay, it says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, 
Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, a lot of times, there's a lot of things in life, whether it's like our sports, whether it's making, you know, not all these things are bad, but they distract us from who? Jesus. Okay? Jesus says that few things are really needed, but one of the things that is needed, the thing that's needed the most, is listening and obeying Jesus and having a relationship with him that changes our hearts. See, Mary was sitting there with Jesus, listening to his words, and Martha was just kind of running around, making the food, getting all the stuff ready, which isn't a bad thing, but she took her eyes off of Jesus. So, what I want you guys to do, what I want you guys to think about, how are we focusing on Jesus, and what are we letting distract us from keeping our eyes on Jesus? Because there's a lot of different things that can distract us. So I want you guys to think about that. You don't have to tell me. Just think about the things that distract you from Jesus, okay? And how we can really focus on what Jesus has to say and what the Bible has to say to us. Okay, so we're going to pray, and then we're going to go to XP, okay? If you guys are in first through fifth grade, we're going to go up to XP, all right? That's you. All right, so let's pray, guys. Uh, Lord, Dad, we love you so much, and we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for all of these amazing kids who are here and their families, Lord. Uh, I pray you'll bless this day. Let's have a good day of worship. Let's experience you. We pray that you transform our hearts and that you uh, just make yourself known to us and that um, we can just grow closer to you today. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys want to come to XP? song that we share and Christians have shared through the years just simply says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let me invite you to stand as we sing this timeless song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. Thank you. Let me ask you to be seated. Many of you, hopefully you were aware that last week we had a group of our senior adults. Ladies, come on up. Group of our senior adults from Young at Heart to go to Owsley County and do some ministry in Jesus' name. So as when the, when the disciples came back, they shared with Jesus what he had done, what the power of God had done as they were out on their mission. That's what we want to do this morning and hear just a word about what happened in Owsley County. From the time the proposal was made to Young at Heart to participate in this mission project, I had no doubt that I should be a part of it. And that's unusual for me. I usually have to give things a thought. But I'm so glad the Lord led me to it. It was truly a blessing. This church's response to the request for clothing to take to uh, Boonville in Owsley County and distribute them was overwhelming. That we had a trailer completely full. We were instructed to mingle with the people as they came to make their selections. And among some of the first I met up with, two of them had lost their homes to fire that week. And others had health issues. And it was just a joy to see the needs met of many people. And, and this uh, mission that's in Boonville is sponsored by First Baptist Church of Frankfurt and Robbie Spear learned of it and being there for a basketball camp I think and referred the project to Young at Heart and I'd like to thank Palvina Pace for making the necessary arrangements for us to be able to do this. Well Paul reminds us in um, Acts 20:35. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I just hate that all of you that gave us the clothes weren't there to receive the blessing that we received uh, when we saw the people coming. And we were supposed to start at nine, but they were there at eight o'clock. And we were supposed to, to uh, leave at noon, and they said, well, let's wait till 12.30. And at 12.30, uh, the coordinator said, um, just leave the things out, and uh, we'll put them up later. If any of you saw the Sunday school room that was completely full of clothes, so this is something that we're sharing with all of you, because uh, you responded just very quickly with, with lots of love and giving lots of clothes that was very needed. Um, the trailer, I don't think, and David Johnson helped us load that trailer. I'm not sure uh, with his engineering, we would have even got it all in there, and I'm not sure we could have gotten another bag of clothing in there. And I thought, there's no way that we can distribute this many clothes. Well, we distributed over half of that trailer in just a little over four hours. She assured that they have the clothing giveaway on Tuesday mornings only. Uh, the coordinator there at the Mission Center assured us that by next Tuesday, every piece of that clothing would be gone. And um, they were coming in wanting work clothes, coats, shoes. They were wanting basic needs. Uh, and all of us, as we climbed on the, back in the van to head back home, we were just overflowing uh, just with the blessing and the, uh, just the euphoria of being able to feel like that we were really, truly helping people. And these were truly help, uh, people in need. If you're familiar with this area, this has the highest poverty rate of any county in the nation. It's a small county, but it's a very high poverty rate. There's no traffic light in the city. Uh, I saw a flash and caution light. Uh, you know, there was a, a, dollar, a dollar store, a dollar general, and uh, a Dairy Queen. I think that was about the only chain restaurants were there. Uh, so it was really a truly great. And when we left, and, and Robbie Spear had told us that, 
this won't be the, this won't be your last trip. Well, before we left, we were discussing going back with a toy drive before Christmas uh, because the coordinator was taking uh, names of all the children that were coming in and making sure that they would know that there would be a toy drive coming up. And then she also said that the ladies there need fabric and need to be able to sew. And so our sewing team wants to go back. She said, there's nobody here in the winter. Um, so if you want to be a part of this next time, there's going to be follow-up opportunities. And, and we just think, especially Robin... Uh, Lawless, who's not a senior citizen, who's not in young at heart, but bless her heart, she drove and she pulled the trailer uh, with all of that heavy load for us and uh, was a great asset, made the trip so much smoother for all of us. And we appreciate her, we appreciate Robin uh, and, and Robbie and the whole team. And we, it was just a blessing for us to be a part of it all. I wish all of you could have been there with us. Emma, before you go, Emma, what what's the what is the oldest person that you had to go? Who who is the old? Well, you don't have to say who is the oldest. It was who? Ninety. And sometimes we say, "I'm too young to do mission work. I'm too old to do mission work. I'm just not equipped to do mission work." And we had a ninety-year-old to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ just through distributing clothes. It can be done, folks. It can be done. There are times when things in our life become difficult. But one thing we have to remember, we, we love so much the verse in the 28th chapter of Matthew, uh, go therefore and, and make disciples of all nations. But sometimes we forget those last words and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Whether things are going well, whether things are not going well, He is with us to the end of the age. He will hold us fast. I want you to listen to this psalm that says, I exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. Going back to the scripture, if you would, please. In the, the Psalms, it says, I will exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. You refuse to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, O oh, Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. So it says, sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor last a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Hear me, Lord, and have mercy on me. Help me, O Lord. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I give, will give you thanks forever. Sometimes maybe what you might be going through is weeping right now. But let me remind you that joy comes in the morning, that Christ will always hold us fast. Let me invite you to stand a new hymn that we learned maybe three weeks ago, so it may be vaguely familiar to you, but focus on the words as we are reminded that Christ will hold us fast.
Would you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Allow me to pray for you as we begin. Our Father, we are grateful, Lord, for the love that you have demonstrated through us through the giving of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that you hold us fast. You hold us in your care. Lord, you provide. You have redeemed us from our sins and given us new life. And Father, as we come to this time in our worship, when we hear your word preached to us this morning, we pray, Father, that your word would shape us. Lord, that our mind and our heart would listen. And Father, we would align our life with your will. Lord, we're so grateful, Lord, for this church. We ask your blessings on her. It's in your name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. So driving down from Bardstown this morning, I have to admit, I was kind of happy You see, I grew up with a father who preached all the time and told stories about my brother and I. And I was thinking, for once, I get the opportunity to turn those tables. But lo and behold, he's up here first. So maybe a little bit later, I can tell something on him. But what a joy it is here for me to be at Camelsville Baptist Church. This is my home church. This is where I grew up. This is where I made my public profession of faith. I was baptized by my father in those baptistry waters, and it is in this place that I learned so many of the truths of Scripture that set me on a life of faithfully seeking to follow him in ministry. Uh, Men like Chester Badgett and James E. Jones were fundamental in their preaching and teaching of God's word and helping me to understand who he was. And as a 19-year-old, um, I joined the ministry staff at First Baptist Church in Junction City, and I don't think I've been back a single Sunday since. One of the struggles of those of us in ministry is that we follow faithfully in the local church. And so for me, it is a personal blessing and a great joy uh, to share in this time with you. But this church is very significant and meaningful to me as I have the opportunity to speak God's word to you. It's with great joy that I do that. So thankful that my family is here uh, this morning uh, to share this time with you. I mean, you ever get dressed up and have no real place to go? Um, You ever had your church directory picture? I remember it was about 11 years ago. My family was getting together uh, for our church directory. At that time, the two boys were pretty small. They were five and two years old. And like most little boys, uh, getting cleaned up and dressed up and wearing shirts that had collars, that wasn't exactly the most fun thing to do. They'd rather be outside. They'd rather be playing around and doing other things. But we got them together, got to our church, time for our pictures. And so we're waiting our turn. We walk into the room. The photographer has us sit in a very awkward, awkward pose and turn our heads in ways that simply don't make sense to us. But we're standing there and we're smiling. And then he has this great idea, the photographer. He walks out in front of my two-year-old son. He has a little toy and he begins to squeak it in front of him. I guess he's thinking this will help my two-year-old smile and be the prettiest little picture and he's going to sell us many copies when we're finished. And then this photographer uh, steps away. But my two-year-old was thinking, here's a toy for me and it squeaks. Thank you very much. I'm happy to receive this toy. But the photographer walked back behind the camera and said for us to smile. Well, this did not go over so well. And so my two-year-old, even though he was dressed really nice and his shirt was tucked in, began to squirm and began to move and began to wiggle around and trying to get that toy. And even in the midst of this, the photographer would reach out from behind the camera and squeak the toy. Look this way, look this way, which made my two-year-old even more upset. And he began to squirm and move, and we were trying to hold him still and pretend smile. You've ever done those things, those pretend smiles when everybody's taking your picture, and just to get through this moment. We finally did. The shirts were no longer tucked. The hair was no longer straight. And we walked out of this room exhausted of what we just went through. But we were all dressed up. And we looked at each other. Is there anywhere else we need to go or want to go? And the answer was absolutely not. Let's get home as soon as we can. We were certainly dressed up with no place to go. Uh, That expression has been in our culture for some hundred years. There's a story in the early 1900s about a hockey team that went to another town uh, expecting to play in a postseason tournament Uh, had their equipment, had their gear, and they got there and found out they were no longer qualified for the postseason. They were dressed up with no place to go. If you take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 3, we're going to see this morning that Paul is instructing the Colossian believers uh, to be dressed up, but they have everywhere to go. 
We believe Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians from his Roman imprisonment around 60 to 62 AD. And we see in this short letter, the first couple of chapters speak about the truth of what Christ has done for us. The third and fourth verse chapters speak about how we are to respond to the truth of what God has done. Quickly, the first couple of chapters, Paul commends them for their faith. Uh, he sets them as a great model and example. Uh, he encourages them to know the full extent of God's love for them. He gives them the, one of the most beautiful pictures of Christ found in all of Scripture. But then he warns them about some mistakes that they were having. You see, the church in Colossians were seeking to add to their spiritual growth by following rules made up by people rather than being faithful to the authority that God had given them. And he sought to correct those behaviors. And so it brings us to our text, beginning in chapter 3, uh, where he speaks to the Colossian church about what it means to be uh, taking a new position. Uh, these were new believers. They had a new spiritual position in their life. And so now they had a new direction that they were going to follow. And he was telling them to take off the things that were old about them and to cast them aside and to take on what was new, what Christ had done in them and given them a new nature, a new nature that was set to please to him. You know, in the last 30 to 40 years, uh, the genre of self-help books have become quite popular in our uh, literary circles. Uh, in fact, over that 30, 40 years, the percentage of the market, of literary market, of self-help books is up 30 uh, to 40 percent. And this idea of being the best version of ourself uh, has become very popular in our culture. However, this is not what Paul is instructing the Colossian believers. It is God who works in us. It is God who works through us to do this sanctifying work of making us more like his son, Jesus Christ. But we have a partnership in this as well. And this is what Paul is instructing them to do of how to faithfully live uh, this out as well. And so the main point of what I want to say to you this morning is simply this. That in light of our new position in Christ... We must take off the practices that define our sinful nature and put on the qualities that reveal the work of our Savior. This is our task this morning. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version in Colossians chapter 3. I want to encourage you to follow along with me and to keep your Bible open as we'll refer to it often over the next few minutes as well. But verses 1 through 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death therefore things, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, the life you once lived, uh, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another as you, if you have any grievances against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to, be, to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is our text this morning, and what I hope to present to you is that we have a new direction as believers. Because of this new position God has given us, that we have a new direction. We're to take off the old practices and put on the new clothes that reveal the work of our Savior. So first of all, what we'll see in the first four verses is that our new position demands a new direction. 
as we look to the text, we see what this new position is like. Now, for many of us, we have new positions all the time. Um, for many of you who are married, when you were married, uh, you gained a new position in life, right? You're no longer single, now you're married. And so therefore, for the rest of your life, you are to treat and care for some one other person differently than all others. And that is a promise that you make. It's a new position, therefore a new direction was required. Uh, they have a new position as believers in Jesus Christ. And so Paul was saying they have a new direction as well. Verse 1 says, since you have been raised with Christ. And Paul presents the meaning of that specifically in verses 3 and 4. He says it through these expressions, that you have died. Um, in other words, we have paid the penalty of sin because of Jesus' blood. Is it his blood provided payment for our sin. It, he died on our behalf. We have received that penalty on Jesus' behalf, and now we are hidden in God. Our new life isn't apparent to the world. Uh, we as believers experience the new life that comes to us through Jesus Christ, though the world may not recognize it yet. But God has given us eternal life. At the moment of our salvation, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that gives us life both now and forever. So we've received that life in verse 4 until uh, his appearing in glory in verse four as well, that God will complete his work in us. Isn't that good news, church? That God will complete his work in us. So we are raised with Christ. This is our new position. We are no longer who we were. So what is it then that needs to be redirected? Uh, Paul identifies two things. First of all, it is our hearts. When we read the word hearts in the scripture, it's speaking more about than just an organ that pumps uh, blood to the rest of your body. But it's speaking about the central essence of who you are, your thoughts, your feelings, your belief, uh, the very presence and person of who you are. And it says to set your hearts on things above. Uh, Jesus said it very similarly in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. He said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, what are the values and the priorities of your life? Paul says to place your greatest value and your greatest priority on things above, not on earthly things. And not only are we to set our, mind, our heart, we're also to set our mind. In other words, what are the thoughts? Are we setting those things on thoughts above as well? See, I believe that the words that come from our mouth are a great reflection of what we think about. When you gather with your friends in this room, um, oftentimes you'll talk about your family. Oftentimes you'll talk about what happened on a college football field yesterday. Oftentimes you'll talk about um, the weather or things involved with your work. Uh, the things that you think about in your life are the things that come out in your words. The words are a reflection of your thought. And Paul says to set your thoughts on things above, not on the earthly things that surround us. Um, Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 4. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, uh, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That we are to direct our heart, our values, our mind, our thoughts on something different. And specifically, it's the person of Jesus that we are to set our thoughts and our gaze, we are to set our priorities upon him and not the things that surround us. You'll notice behind me as well, uh, a guitar that we use for worship. I love to hear and watch folks play guitar. Um, but one of the things that's required every time a guitar is played uh, in, a, in a worship setting like this, before any of you arrive, is that guitar has to be tuned. In other words, the strings will stretch and uh, he could play it just fine, but it wouldn't sound as though what we expect. And the guitar must be tuned each time it's used. I think sometimes church as believers, we think because when we were nine years old, we walked to the front of the church and made a profession of our faith in Jesus Christ, that our minds and our hearts will always be fixed on Jesus. We know that's not true. Uh, in the same way that a guitar has to be retuned each time it's played, I believe that every morning we must set our hearts and our minds on Jesus. We must set our hearts and our minds on the one who has done these great works in us rather than the things that surround us. When you, walk, when you get up in the morning, what fills your mind? Is it your obligations for the day? Is it people in your family that you're perhaps worried about? Or is it the person of Jesus? And I believe, church, if we place our hearts and our minds on the person of Jesus, we walk in a new direction. Moving on to verse 5, we see the next part of our text that our new possession, position also demands taking off the practices of the sinful nature. That we're to take these things away. 
So I grew up on a farm here in Taylor County. Um, I live in Bartstown now, and our farm consists of about uh, a dozen plants that are in front of our house. Okay, that's, that's all that there is. Uh, but when we planted these things, we were careful, my wife and I, to, to lay down the landscape fabric and, uh, for the hope that weeds wouldn't grow. Uh, but even though when we put mulch on top of that, some rocks, other things, uh, but invariably, the longer it gets from that time, more and more weeds grow up in this uh, landscaping that's around our house. Does that happen at your home? Sometimes I think that the landscaping in, in, around our house might be the most fertile grounds in all of Nelson County. If there was ever a food shortage, everything seems to grow there. Uh, but every once in a while, we take some time to remove those weeds. And if you pull a weed out and it breaks off uh, at the ground, we know what? That that weed is going to grow right back. Uh, but what we look for is that rainy day when the ground is soft and you can pull out that, root, that weed by the root. And you know that you've removed that weed from the landscaping area. Church, we need to hear this, that it's, it's not a matter of limiting our sinful nature. It's not a matter of controlling our sinful nature. Uh, Paul says we are to get rid of it. We are to pull it out by the root and cast it aside that it is no longer a part of who we are. We are to get rid of these things. And so let's look at what the text says beginning in, in verse 5. It seems as though there's this battle and tension between things that are old and things that are new. You see, as believers, God has given us a new nature. A 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things are gone and everything has become new. So we have this new nature within us that is meant to please the Lord. But it's in contrast and intention and conflict with this outer nature, of this fleshly nature that we have that is meant on pleasing ourselves. And there seems to be this constant battle. Uh, it's though we are new creations in old bodies, and we're having this constant battle. But Paul's instruction to us is that we are to put to death these practices that define our sinful nature. This is our responsibility along with the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Again, it's not a matter of self-help, of doing the best that we can, but it's a matter of faithfully walking in the Spirit and allowing Him to work in us. Paul writes it this way in Romans chapter 8. He says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So we have a task that we are to do. Paul gives us, if you look through uh, in verses 5 and 8, a couple of sample list of sins. Uh, one of the things that oftentimes when sins are listed in Scripture, uh, be careful to think they're not exhaustive lists. In other words, uh, you're looking for one that might check you, and if you don't, you pass. Uh, they're sample lists. They're, they're representative. Uh, and I believe on, on the 10 that are listed in verse 5 and 8, all of us in this room are going to find ourselves uh, landed on. But these are examples of sins that we are to eliminate from our life. Uh, sexual, sensual sins sins that listed in verse 5. Sexual immorality is simply sexual activity outside of covenant marriage. Impurity are the immoral thoughts that happen within our minds. Lust are these evil intentions that come within us. Evil desires is when we plant seeds uh, to do that lead towards action. Um, greed is always wanting more for ourselves. The scripture says this is idolatry. We put things in front of God. We look down to verse 8, we see these social sins that are before us as well. Uh, this idea of anger, that we have a habit of wrath coming from our life, that it's the habit of who we are, it's how we treat and speak to people. Uh, this idea of rage, in other words, a sudden outburst of anger that we might have towards certain situations. Malice is an attitude of ill will or um, trying to denigrate someone else. Slander, speech that tears people down. And finally, filthy language, obscene words coarse humor, and sometimes simply just going along with those who do. In verse 9, we see this specific mention of lying, of misleading people, uh, how harmful that is to our new nature and to the body of Christ. And finally, in verses 6 and 7, we see the two motives for this elimination is because these are the very sins that were bringing God's wrath. And so these are the things then that we are to get rid of. He goes on to say that these are part of your past. They're not part of your present. They're not part of your future. Quit living in your old manner. Church, this is what we are to do. This is the hard work of growing in our faith. We get rid of the old practices of the sinful nature. A couple of things to encourage you to do. Be faithful to the hearing of God's word. That's why the leaders of your church think it's so important of you to be faithful on Sunday morning for worship. 
That's why the leaders of your church think it's so important for you to be faithful in the small groups on Sunday morning, that you are surrounding yourself where the Bible is being rightly taught in a way that encourages and God uses it to shape your life, to love and serve him more. Um, also, don't isolate yourself from other believers. I think in our, our culture today, uh, we live in a world where people build walls around their life and they're unwilling and untrusting and simply just um, negligent about sharing their journey and their walk with other folks. But I believe, church, this is important and crucial for how we are to live out our faith with one another. So be careful that you don't isolate yourself from the word. Be careful you don't isolate yourself from other believers and faithfully seek with the power of the spirit within you to put to death the misdeeds of the body, these practices of the old sinful nature. In the final part of our text, uh, beginning in the last half of verse nine and running through verse 10, we see that our new position demands putting on the qualities that reveal the work of our Savior. Well, I'm not sure what team you might root for, if it's a college team or pro team. Perhaps you enjoy postseason baseball or uh, football on Sundays. Uh, perhaps your favorite sport is your seven or eight or nine year old little kid on a soccer team, and that's the team that's most important to you. Whatever team it might be that you follow, uh, one of the things that's characteristic about all sports teams is they, they have a common uniform. Uh, it identifies them from the other team, it identifies them from other people, it allows them to be uh, marked as a unit. Uh, together as a team. And in the same way, Paul's saying for us is to put on the qualities that reveal the work of our Savior, that we are to put on this new self. The language is very much that that we are getting dressed. And so what is it then that we are to wear? What is it that we are to do? Um, I think we see uh, several things that we need to, as parameters and clarifications for us. Uh, first in verse 11, he speaks about these uh, divisions that come within the church. He says, there's, there's no longer Jew and, and Gentile. You see, these were ethnic divides, uh, and there's no place for ethnic divides in the body of Christ. He talked about those who were circumcised and those who were not. It spoke about their religious background and uh, perhaps the way they were brought up and what they knew culturally about their religion, but now they were part of one family and one unit. You see, there's no religious background distinctions in the body of Christ, for we were all one in Jesus. He talks about these uh, folks who they labeled as barbarians and even Scythians. Barbarians were those uh, that they considered outside of the Greek-speaking world. Scythians were one of the specific groups that they felt were most barbaric. And it says, the cultural differences no longer have distinction in the body of Christ. That there are no longer cultural distinctions for those of us who are one in Christ Jesus. He talks about those who are slave and those who are free. Uh, the slavery was part of the economic system of the first century Palestinian world. And he says, those things no longer have distinction. There are no longer economic distinctions for those of us who are one in Christ Jesus. We're on the same team. We wear the same uniform. We don't have distinctions between one or another. And let's be faithful to treat each other in that way. He says that we are God's holy, chosen people. He uses these words, chosy, chosen, holy, and loved. Uh, that somehow, some way, God had foreknowledge of our salvation before the creation of the world. He says that we are holy, not because of what we have done, because we have been set apart because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and that we are loved. We are the receivers of the grace of Jesus Christ that has come to us through our salvation. And so simply, what is it then that we are to wear? What does this uniform look like that we are to put on? We see a third list of five things in verse 12. And so these are the things, believers, that we are to wear. These are the things that people are to see when they look to us. People are to see compassion. They are to see kindness. They are to see humility. They are to see gentleness, strength under control. They are to see patience. It goes on to say that we are to bear one another. In other words, we're to put up with one another. I don't know if you had a sibling and you went on long car rides as, as kids and uh, before the end of that ride, you might be poking at one another, picking at each other, pulling each other's ear, just really getting on one another's nerves. Well, the reality is sometimes we feel that other people in the world do that to us all the time, right? That people sometimes grate our nerves. Uh, the reality, church, is this, is that none of us are perfect. Let's quit holding that expectation upon one another and simply bear with one another. Be patient, be compassionate, and be kind. 
It says that we are to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. How has Christ forgiven us? He has taken our sins and completely taken them away. I love the psalm that says that our sins are as far as the east is from the west. You know, why didn't uh, the psalmist say they're as far as the north is from the south? Well, uh, God has given us this planet, right? And we can go north as far as we can and we come to the North Pole. We can go south as far as we can and we come to the South Pole. And we can measure the difference between those two places. How far can we go east? We can continue to travel east. No matter where we are, there's always an eastern direction. How far can we go west? There's always a western direction as well. And so how far is the east from the west? We can't measure it. That's how far Christ has taken away our sins. And so Paul says that we are to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. In other words, what does that mean? That we don't hold grudges against people who wrong us. When people say things that hurt our feelings, we don't treat them differently or shut them out of our life. Uh, We forgive one another as many times as necessary, for that is how Christ has forgiven us. And finally, we see that we are to love one another. It is the primary part of our garment. It is the thing that binds all these things together. Uh, Peter writes this in in 1 Peter 4. He says, above all, love each other deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. One of the uh, great blessings of my life was to be able to uh, to coach uh, one of my sons in fourth through sixth grade uh, basketball, the little little league traveling teams that we had in our area. And uh, it was was great fun. Uh, One of the things about trying to teach uh, young kids basketball, you know, I was having visions of grandeur of me as a coach. And so I'm talking to them about spacing and cutting and uh, moving the ball and uh, trying to to teach all these kind of things. And uh, basically they were looking to me to know when they get to shoot the ball, right? And uh, one of the things, there's kind of a silver bullet in basketball is that when a person takes a shot and it goes in, it seems like everything worked right, you know? Everything else doesn't really matter. It's not near as important. It seemed like what you were teaching worked. In the same way, our love covers a multitude of sins, uh, that even in the flaws of who we are, when we seek to love one another deeply, with great affection, it covers a multitude of other struggles. And so church, let's be that church that loves one another deeply, that covers a multitude of all these other sins that we have as well. And as we see, uh, Paul makes some specific applications of this for how we are as believers to continue to walk this out. Verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule. Uh, The word rule there is uh, the same word that we would use for an umpire who has dominion over a game. Uh, He makes the cause of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, So in other words, let peace be the ruler in our life. In other words, the words that we say, the deeds that we do, let peace be the guide that says whether what we are doing is right or not. Imagine a group of 10 of you got together after uh, Sunday school today to go to lunch together. And one person spoke up and says, I think we should go here regardless of where everyone else wants to go. A person is simply not seeking peace, they're seeking their own desires. Uh, In the same way, let our words and our action seek peace among the body of Christ. In verse 16, it says to let the message of Christ dwell. The message of Christ is the gospel. It's the story that the Bible tells from start to finish. It's that the ever-loving, ever-existent God created our world. And the highlight of his creation was you and I. And in our freedom that God has given us, we've chosen to live for ourselves instead of for him. The Bible refers to this as sin, and we are in rebellion from the Lord. And because God is just and because he's holy, he cannot allow the presence of sin in his presence. And so we have a major problem because of our sin. But out of God's infinite love for us, he provides for us a solution to our sin problem. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for our sins by death on the cross. And then when we repent of our sins and believe in him, we receive a new nature. We receive a new righteousness from the Lord that is not of ourselves. It is from Christ. And therefore we are no longer held guilty of these sins. And we are united forever with Christ and adopted into his family. That is the gospel. That is the message of Christ. And Paul says, let that dwell in your life. It's like the relative who comes over to your house and never leaves. Um, it's, they just take up residence there and you're looking like, are you ever going to go? Um, let the message of the gospel dwell in your heart. Think about these things. Psalm says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
Paul says it's for these two things that we might teach and admonish one another. Uh, to, to teach is to instruct someone. To admonish is the opposite, is to correct someone. Uh, that we do these things and it develops this emotional stir that we might sing a song of joy for the Lord. I love standing up here at the front of the worship center this morning uh, to hear the church, hear you singing uh, with joy for the Lord. No matter the song, no matter the arrangement, it's who we sing to that matters. And so let us sing with a grateful heart, full of thankfulness for who God is. And finally, in verse 17, let the name of Christ motivate. Let his name motivate. Whatever our word, whatever our deed, let his name motivate lead us as well. Um, you've given this speech to your children perhaps when you arrive somewhere important and you've spoken to them and said, all right, make sure everything you do is a good reflection on who we are. And those of you who are educators uh, and you've traveled with school groups, uh, you've said that to your students right before your field trip arrival. Now make sure you're representing our school. Make sure your behavior well reflects us. Uh, those of us who, who volunteer and work in churches, uh, when we travel with groups, so especially with young people, we'll say to them, uh, make sure your words and behavior reflect Christ and who we are as a church. Um, believers, this is what we are to do with word and deed, is to reflect Christ, that this is the uniform that we put on ourselves. So growing up here in Taylor County, um, had the blessing of growing up on a farm where we, we did a lot of work. Now, I, I want to make one point very clear that as a teenage boy, I did not consider that a blessing at all. Um, I considered that work. Uh, looking back, it's, I can see somehow there was some blessing there. And uh, one of the things, though, with my mom and dad that you know, um, they are involved in lots of different things, oftentimes through church, through the school here, through other organizations that would require my brother and I to be dressed up for things. Well, the combination of working on the farm where you get dirty, hot, sweaty, smelly, muddy, uh, and going to places where you need to wear ties and uh, be clean and smell good and uh, look nice um, often involved this transition. Uh, so when we would come into house, we would literally kind of peel off the things uh, that were, were, were dirty. We would peel off the things that were muddy and cast them aside. We would go clean up and put on new clothes fitting to the occasion that we were to go. Believers, this is what we do. Uh, because of our new position in Christ, we are to cast aside, we are put to death, put those things off to define who we were before we knew the Lord and put on the new self that God is making in us that reflect and reveal the qualities of what Christ has done for us. And so my question is simply this this morning. What is it that you are wearing? What do you put on? What is it that's coming out from your life? What do others see when they look at you? Do they see the work of the sinful nature or do they see the evidence of Christ's work in you? Let's be dressed up because we have everywhere to go. Let me pray for you. Father, so thankful, Lord, for this church, and Father, for the truth of your word today. And I pray, Father, as we hear it, as we respond to it, oh Lord, that if there might be someone here this morning who simply recognizes this reality is that they do not have a new position in you, that the reality of this gospel story that we shared just simply a few minutes ago, um, they have never repented of sin and believed in their heart of what you've done. I pray for them specifically, Lord, that they might have an opportunity to respond to this message. Father, for many of us, we have been believers in Christ for decades. And Father, we have been seeking to faithfully walk with you. But Father, the practices of the sinful nature have crept their way back into our life. When we look in the mirror, we see the evidence of this old sinful self that keeps reoccurring in who we are. Father, we pray, Lord, through the partnership of your Holy Spirit, we would put those things to death. And that, Father, you would do an incredible new work in us as we faithfully seek to put on the uniform of a believer. Father, I pray, Lord, your work would continue in the hearts and minds of each and every person this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to have a time to respond and sing. Uh, the pastors of this church will be here to receive you if you have a decision that you would like to make or simply a time to pray and someone to pray with you. But however the Lord leads you at this time, I pray that you be faithful and respond uh, to that. Sing with us. Come out of 
sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow. Well, as you can see, it is OCC time. Um, so we just want to invite you to come pick up one, two, or even ten boxes. Um, pack them with a bunch of goodies. If you haven't looked at the Samaritan's Purse website, it has lots of different um, suggestions on things to pack for different age groups. Um, some new things this year. The cost is $9 for um, your donation for shipping and covering other expenses, so that's a little different, as well as no food items. Um, I also saw on there no toothpaste, and it's all because of the different customs regulations that are um, out. So just a couple reminders with that, um, but let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much 
for this beautiful, beautiful day. I thank you for the freedom to um, come and worship so freely. And I thank you for um, this blessed country that we live in. And God, I just pray right now that um, you will bless each and every box that is packed. Um, your word tells us that you go before us. And so, Lord, we just know that you're going to do awesome, awesome things um, with the boxes, not only for those that receive them, but for those that pack them and um, ship them. And so, God, I just pray that um, not only will these boxes be an immediate um, answer to prayer for specific needs, but also will just be an answer to prayer for um, furthering the kingdom and just for spreading the gospel and for um, sharing the word and sharing Christ's love. In Jesus' name, amen. It is so cool to see what is happening all over the country today. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity to be a part of putting together these shoe boxes for kids around the world who've never had a gift. She said we can ask everyone to bring an item to put in an Operation Christmas Child shoe box. He said, Mom, I want to do a packing party. When Jordan came up with the idea to do 5,000 shoe boxes, it made me laugh because it's like, of course you would do that. After today in our packing party, how many do you think we'll have? A thousand. My name is Jordan. I am nine years old. I am reaching out to other churches, doctors, hospitals, dentists. I'm trying to fill a thousand shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. It is so much fun to watch Jordan do her thing and then she'll hand over her business card and I think that's my favorite part because they don't know what to do with it. Some people go like, wow, a business card. I don't even have one of those. <laughs> yeah, Jordan just doesn't see any limitations. What God is able to do through her has just been an awesome lesson for both my husband and I. I started the Seabox Club when I was eight years old. We have about 80 members that come every month and we pack 40 to 50 shoeboxes each month. Our motto is kids helping kids around the world. My name is Faith and I'm nine. Our daughter had a, a severe birth defect called spina bifida. The doctor told us that hers was so severe that she would never walk. Faith came up to me and Robin and she said, I want to do a 5K run so I can show people that God made me walk. And then we can ask everyone to bring an item to put in an Operation Christmas Child shoe box. And we just got to see the miracle God had done right in front of our eyes. David, he said, Mom, I want to do a packing party. Hey, everybody, it's David here. We just got 558 boxes in the van. Like, that's unbelievable. Like, I've never done that. When the child opened the shoe box up, I hope they feel that Jesus loves them. I believe in a big God, he could make it possible. And people should know that. And a good way to show them that is when you let God work through you and do amazing things. Anybody can pack a shoebox. It reaches people and it can change lives. Beautiful are the feet that take the gospel. What would you say to other kids out there who maybe want to do something to help other kids? Go ahead. It's, it's a hands-on project. Anybody can do it. Stand with me as we close out in a word of prayer. Don't forget about Circle Makers tonight. If you've not had an opportunity to plug in, plug in all over the county. So uh, look forward to seeing you there. So bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for everything you've given, Lord. I want to thank you for the word this morning. Lord, of those things that we should put off and, and those things that we should put on. Lord, allow us to uh, carry that with us throughout the week and the weeks to come, Lord, that, uh, Lord, your word uh, can be on the tips of our tongue, Lord. Be with us. In your name we pray. Amen.